Assalamu alaikum everyone. Um, so let's get started. Uh, today's session, we're going to be uh, covering quite a lot of ground. Uh, but before I go do that, um, our uh, next uh, Thursday uh, session, I'm going to have to cancel that. And uh, we're going to have a sim, uh, class um, on Saturday. Um, that will be uh, that will be on 13th March, uh, same time, and uh, I'll send you guys an email uh, with that. Um, so I have some commitments um, pretty much throughout the week, next week, and uh, I know that most of us um, are attending other classes as well, so I don't want to step over, you know, their foot. So we will um, have our next week session will be on Saturday uh, 13th uh, same time 7 p.m. Uh, Chicago time. Um, so you will be receiving an email uh, pretty shortly from me right after this class uh, just as a reminder. OK, so uh, today's session uh, we are going to cover um, quite a bit of ground here and uh, Today's session will be um, like I will be running slide deck and uh, for all the lab uh, of today's session we will be doing in our next class. So next class will be um, pretty much all um, you know uh, lab work uh, going into the console and you know uh, performing the work there. OK and. Uh, Alrighty, so um, today we are going to cover um, AWS security, which is uh, identity and access management. This is what we're going to cover. We're going to go uh, deep dive uh, into it. And uh, second topic for today is uh, AWS monitoring and management. Uh, here we're going to cover uh, uh, Cloud Trail and CloudWatch. Then uh, next topic is AWS storage related. Uh, we will be covering the block storage and object storages and different tiers and different classes. Uh, their use cases, how they are being used, and then uh, there are some miscellaneous topics uh, about um, availability, reliability, and durability, uh, plus uh, the SLA, which is the service level agreement, how, how we calculate that and how uh, is it, um, uh, you know, uh, how does it fit, you know, uh, in this cloud picture? So these are the things which, uh, you know, we're going to be covering uh, aggressively today. Okay. All righty. Um, so let's uh, dig right in and. Uh, AWS um, Identity and Access Management or INAM. Give me one second. Give me one second. Let me paste the link here real quick. So this um, actually mainly talks about um, the identity part and the access part. Um, how is your identity get validated uh, inside the system? And uh, like, how do you get the console access or how do you get the access to your application or, or the infrastructure underneath it? And uh, what level of access uh, do you have uh, this access piece, you know, um, uh, talks about that. So these are the two critical pieces um, in any cloud provider. Um, actually, regardless of cloud provider, uh, regardless, you know, even if it is on on your on-prem deployment, um, it has the uh, you know same uh, importance or significance there as well. Um, 
so Amazon actually um, offers um, different services uh, that you know details around you know um, this uh, IAM or IAM area. Uh, one of them is the one of them as the you know as the name suggests you know identity and access management. It manages the access to services and resources. Um, Amazon offers, as you know, that you know, the Amazon offers tons and tons of services. So um, in an organization, you know, you define the scope of a person uh, that um, let's say if it's a developer or if it's a, uh, a production team or if it's a support team or if it's the management um, and you define the uh, their uh, their level of access that, you know, what services can they access and what services they cannot. And same goes with the resources. Let's say you have uh, uh, two different environments uh, running. One is uh, production and another is non-production. Uh, so normally um, the non-production is uh, uh, you, you grant the access to the developers so that they could develop you know, the application there. And uh, for the production environment, you grant the access to the production team uh, uh, apart from the uh, development team or the engineering team. Um, so this um, IAM piece um, manages or handles, you know, this uh, this management or granular access of of uh, of your resources uh, to those um, AWS services. Along with that, Amazon also offers a single sign-on or SSO single uh, service, um, and you know there are a couple other like cognitive service or directory services, uh, uh, ARM or access resource uh, sorry AWS resource manager and um, AWS organization. Um, single sign-on is uh, um, from uh, from a very layman term is uh, you log in once and then you get access to all the services. As an example, you log into your Gmail account um, and then with that Gmail account, once you logged into it, then you have access to all the uh, Google services like you know Google Forms or Google Drive or um, you know, uh, whatever and whatnot, the other services are there. So, you know, just one sign on and, uh, you know, you, you get the access to that. So AWS SSO uh, that handles it for you. Um, Cognito, it actually handles the identity management for your applications. Let's say you are building an application, a serverless application. Uh, you normally, you know, use this Cognito service to, uh, to uh, manage the access of, uh, you know, the application side. Uh, AWS Directory Services, it's just uh, it's similar as Microsoft Active Directory or AD. Um, Amazon, you know, came up with their own um, directory service. Um, let's say you do not have any footprint in the uh, in the Microsoft side. Let's say you do not have the uh, Azure AD or on-prem AD. Um, you use um, um, uh, Amazon is offering the similar service, which you can use to you know set up the directory where uh, you have your users accessing it. Uh, uh, like you put your user, their roles, and uh, you put in, the, you know, the resources, and then you know you go in granular that you know which resource has access to what, um, you know, through that through the directory service, you know, you can define it, you know, for your enterprise wide. Um, then you know access, oh, sorry, AWS uh, resource uh, access manager, um, similar principle, but this is for the uh, you know the, for the resources you know that are running. Uh, inside your AWS account. AWS organization is uh, for those uh, is it is a centralized um, model uh, where let's say your organization has let's say. Um, let me just quickly go to this whiteboard and I can get you there. So here uh, let's say. Uh, you have an organization here. You have a marketing department. Let's say you have your finance department. You have your IT department. And let's say within your IT, you have your um, engineering team and you have your operations team. And uh, let's say, uh, you know, these uh, three departments that you have. So marketing, let's say they have their own um 
AWS uh, account and they have their own AWS console and account and you know they are building they have built their application and it is running underneath that. Let's say finance has the similar type approach. Um, let's say they have you know two different accounts, uh, two different AWS accounts, and you know uh, they are running their uh, you know different applications or you know different workloads uh, running under you know these two accounts there. Let's say inside the IT, uh, you have the similar thing, um, one for operations and one for engineering or engineering or slash development team. They have you know those accounts. So from an overall organization standpoint, uh, you will be uh, you know you are maintaining you know these uh, groups. They are maintaining their own silos and um, you know managing their accounts. You know their their billing and everything is maintained you know individually. So what AWS organization does is you create one organizational account and you attach all these accounts to it. So this way you will have one single governance account that is overseeing all those accounts. It's mainly for the uh, for the billing purposes um, that you have one account. Uh, you have one you have one organization uh, that is handling your your billing and all that. Uh, but as far as the technical side goes, so marketing is handling their own technical stuff. Um, you know, finance is doing the, their same, and you know, IT is doing their own. So uh, the the main purpose of this organization is to to provide a single management console through which you can manage all those uh, you know individual accounts. Okay, um, let's go a little bit deeper into the IAM. Um, there are two actually there are you know uh, uh, somewhat four uh, four or more uh, different principles uh, inside the IAM, but um, from a very top level, there are two major demarcations inside the IAM piece that IAM you know handles it for you. One is called the authentication, and another is called the authorization. Authentication is who I am. An authorization is what am I here for? So let's say if this is me and uh, I have the valid username and password, you know, I go, uh, I provided the username and password, uh, it get authenticated uh, either against the, you know, the flat file or or through the, you know, the through some directory service. And, uh, you know, based on that, I either I will get the access to that application or, or uh, I, you know, I could get denied, you know, access to it. So authentication, you know, mainly deals with, mainly deals with, uh, you know, the uh, this piece here, which is the, um, you know, uh, the the username and the password area um, that, um, that, like, who I am, you know, am I allowed to? You know, authenticate into it, or am I? Is my credential working, or is my credential valid enough to at least step into the system? So once I step into the system, um, so uh, uh, you know, from that point, uh, tracking back to you know when I was knocking the door up to you know stepping into the uh, into the system, that piece is handled by the authentication. Now for the authorization piece, what it does is once I am uh, step into the system. Now it tells me if, if I have the admin access or not, or if I have the editor access or not, or if I have only, let's say, a read only access to that specific application area. Or let's say, um, you know, the application has, um, you know, different, uh, different areas. Uh, let's say it has, uh, you know, the admin console, it has the management console. Um, it has the user or the uh, or the you know data console or the data access or you know there is you know there are some you know specific areas you know within the application. So there are you know let's say you know a couple of demarcation lines there. So my authorization tells me if I have access to this area or or not to this area or maybe to other areas or maybe to, you know denied access to you know all of them. So this is the authorization piece. Authentication is who I am, and authorization is what am am I here for. So the authorization piece, you know, defines it. So these granular details they are handled very well within um, 
IAM piece um, inside the uh, AWS console. Uh, we grant access to, um, at times we grant access to a single resource to go and you know uh, access uh, that specific area, or uh, the best practice is that you create one role and then you you know attach those users to that role, and that you that role uh, will have the access to uh, or the authorization to go, let's say, into the EC2 area or the S3 area, or not go into the uh, into the database area. So this way, you know, a user will not have the uh, you know those permissions or the authorizations, but actually that role will have those authorizations. Um, that this is the best practice that you create the role and then attach or you know assign or remove the user you know out of it. So that is you know, mainly you know being done as part of the roll on roll off process. When a user, when you have a new user coming into your organization, uh, you are grand you know you're working on their authentication piece and also working on their authorization piece. So this is all. Overall, it's called the uh, roll on process. The person is being rolled on to your uh, to your organization. And then on the other side, the roll off is, let's say uh, the person moved off, uh, moved on and you know moved out of your organization or moved into a different project and he's or she's not currently uh, in actively engaged or not engaged at all into, you know, into let's say, you know, person was working in the finance. Now he or she has moved to, let's say, marketing. So you re you revo revoke all their access, so you know you remove them from the um, you know from the uh, you know all these authorizations uh, like remove them from uh, all those roles, so that you know they will not be able to access it you know um, down the road. This is like you know person moving you know from one group to another. Let's say person is let's say person is fired or person is uh, you know laid off or or you know person has moved on to a different company same process follows for the uh, for the roll on uh, roll on aspect oh sorry roll off aspect as well like in my organization uh, we have 24 hours to revoke all the accesses when a person is rolled off either person has moved out of the company or person has moved from you know, from one project to another project uh, this is our audit requirement that we have to ensure that you know within 24 hours uh, we revoke everything you know from the uh, from the security systems Okay, um, so those services which we you know discuss in here, we're gonna go a little bit deeper on that. Um, there are a couple of areas, um, as I mentioned, apart from the you know authorization and authentication, uh, there are different other you know security areas as well. Um, detection is one of them. Um, protection is another. Um, you know infrastructure protection, you know data protection, and um, and then you know responses to the incident and then the compliance. So these are the things you know which uh, we're gonna look into. Uh, I'm not gonna go into any uh, into console on on all of them, uh, but I'll I'll just you know go over those now, and then you know on our Saturday call we will you know um, go look into you know uh, these areas. On the detection side, this is uh, this is more of a security detection. Uh, like you are securing your uh, let's say your infrastructure is here. And uh, you know you have you know different instances or storages and uh, databases and whatever and whatnot are running in here. Um, so you have you know for for the protection um, you know of this area. So you actually build a um, um, you know uh, a protection boundary around your infrastructure. So some of the boundaries, um, some of the you know capabilities um, which we're gonna uh, look into in a bit. Uh, they are to uh, they are, they're working as a guard duty uh, or guard as you know at the perimeter uh, of your uh, infrastructure and their purpose is to detect let's say if there's a malicious attack is coming in uh, the purpose of you know these uh, majority of these services is to detect and then you know inform you that there is you know some malicious activity happening on the protection side uh, so Whenever a malicious, you know, activity, you know, is being detected, then the protection, you know, kicks in and protection stops it either from the uh, for the infrastructure standpoint or protection for the data standpoint. Now your data standpoint um, mainly is is your database. That is the uh, the key resource that every organization, you know, um, uh, tries to you know preserve or save it as 
as secure as possible. So for the detection services, um, give me one second. Come on. Okay. So for the detection services, um, you know, um, Amazon has, you know, a security hub and uh, also, uh, so it's a unified security and it's a, it's a one single pane of glass or, or, or single dashboard uh, that actually tells about your current security posture, that how many services are enabled and uh, uh, if there's any service, you know, that is enabled uh, that may go, you know, against your, uh, your organization. So, uh, I, against your organization means like, you know, we created uh, the security group that has actually, that was open uh, for the internet, like, you know, we open for zero, 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 zero. So, um, if if I go into the security hub right now, it will tell me that, you know, it is open for the entire world. So, I I need to secure it. I need to uh, uh, narrow it down, uh, narrow down its scope to maybe, you know, to the internal groups instead of, you know, opening it for the for the rest of the world. Um, Ali Adarbhai has a question. Yes, please go ahead. Assalamu alaikum. Assalamu alaikum. Hope, uh, your vo my voice is coming to you. Yes, I can. My, yeah. uh, my question is uh, whenever one person moves to a different department from existing one, is the management or admin going to revoke the permission from existing one and then give the permission to the new one? Which is the scenario? Yep. So, yep. So, so what happens is, um, uh, good question here. Uh, so, what happens is, uh, let's say a person was working in finance, now moving to marketing. So, when the person is moving or rolling off from finance to marketing, so the finance team who is managing the finance uh, infrastructure. They will revoke his or her access, you know, from uh, all the services of wherever, you know, the person has access to. Uh, similar thing, you know, in the marketing side, there will be a team uh, since the person is embarking on or rolling on, um, you know, in the marketing side. So they will, you know, grant him access to whatever the areas, you know, uh, that person you know, needs to have access to. So there will be, uh, if it's a big company, there will be two different teams. Uh, you know, working on uh, one team will be working on rolling off, another team will be working on roll on. In a small firm, in a small firm, uh, there may be only one, uh, you know, one team uh, handling, you know, uh, marketing, finance, IT, and other groups, and uh, you know, just revoking the access, you know, from one area and granting access to the other areas. Right. Um, so security hub, hub uh, is, you know, it's a it's a unified, you know, pane of glass uh, that tells you not just on security, but, you know, the compliance side as well. Then Amazon guard duty, uh, what it does is uh, it manages all the th threats uh, that are being detected and it handles those. Um, uh, also, you know, same thing, same principle. Um, it works on, you know, uh, it has its own dashboard that tells you uh, what is the, you know, the current uh, you know, uh, uh, threat landscape uh, at this time for for your entire infrastructure. Amazon Inspector, Amazon Config, Cloud Trail, IoT Device Defender. You know, these are you know some additional services. Uh, they they do the same thing. You know, on the detection side. Next one, the protection side. Um, uh, there's one service which is called AWS Shield, which is the DDoS or a distributed denial of service protection. And I'm going to come to DDoS um, in a bit. We have a slide, uh, you know, for you know for this DDoS. Yeah. Then there is a AWS WAF or uh, Web Application Firewall. It's a layer seven firewall, yeah. and uh, uh, it it runs at the top layer. Um, is uh, is there a question? I see, sister, you raised your hand. Uh, yes. I sure. just wanted to understand the security part more. So this is basically uh, additional. I mean, you know, when we create those uh, access points at that time, like you know, open to the world at that time, those conditions 
cannot define uh, roles or you, I would rather say, can, can they not funnel down the users? So um, we, did the, we did a very basic lab um, last week. And next week, you know, we're going to look into, you know, once we're going to go do the lab, you know, that's where we're going to go a uh, deep dive into the security side, like how the IAM security we're going to build around it, how the security groups, um, you know, narrowing down. That's what we're going to look into. So to answer your question, um, at times what happens is uh, you just simply create the infrastructure, let's say, you know, your development team is on the ground and uh, they just start you know building it uh, without keeping the security in the focus so they build it and then um, then your security team you know finds out hey you know what uh, they were granted access now they open everything to the world uh, their security group is open for the rest of the world uh, now we need to you know secure it down so then you know they started you know they start working on you know uh, on the security side and you know securing that um, like narrowing down the scope or shutting down the public access uh, public access i mean you know the internet access and um, uh, you know uh, they just ensure that you know uh, whatever uh, the security loopholes that were detected uh, they need to plug them before you know uh, their system got uh, you know gets compromised okay Alrighty. Um, next one. Um, so AWS a web application firewall. It actually you know works at you know there are actually several layers uh, in OSI model, and um, we're gonna look into in our uh, networking segment net network section. Um, the top layer is called the uh, application layer. That's where your application is writing. Also, it is called layer seven as well. So mostly your application is the one that is interfacing uh, to the world, to the Internet. And we need to ensure that um, the layer, uh, this application layer, it has enough protection uh, built around that uh, so that, you know, those malicious attackers or, or uh, you know, or, or the hackers, uh, they will not get access or they will not you know perform any malicious activity to to bring down you know our application so uh, ddos is one area um, that you know that we need to protect and uh, the second is the uh, web application firewall or the WAF. what it does is uh, it ensures that you know the cross-site scripting or uh, or sql poisoning and you know these type of you know attacks uh, they they get deterred uh, before even you know they reach to to your application. So uh, uh, WAF actually you know runs on top of you know your uh, your application layer, and uh, you know AWS Shield actually it runs uh, pretty much you know around your perimeter, and that is also uh, for protection you know for the um, for the infrastructure and protection you know from the outsiders to come in and you know perform any um any any malicious activity on that the next one is the aws firewall manager uh, same same principle it's a centralized management uh, of firewall rules although there are various layers of you know security security group is uh, is also a type of firewall and then on top of it there is an, uh, another security tool uh, which is called NACL or network address uh, um, uh, network ACL, uh, which is uh, a network access control list. So these are the two built in uh, into your um, into your VPC. And then on top of it, if you want uh, some additional layer of protection, uh, you can utilize, you know, AWS Firewall Manager. And then, you know, there are some third party tools as well, which, you know, could be deployed uh, at strategic locations uh, for the security. I just I just have one more question. Yeah, sure. Uh, so in case say uh, I mean uh, obviously this is a very vast topic. So in case company makes an instance and you know create a firewall and buys, I guess all of these components need to be bought separately. The security aspect, especially. No, and, uh, no, not not really. Um, majority of the tools, you know, they are 
part of your built-in uh, account. Okay. And then, you know, uh, some additional layer, uh, let's say you have a very complex infrastructure that you're building, mm -hmm. and then you might need to, uh, you know, either look into AWS, uh, you know, paid services, like Firewall Manager is one of them, um, or, or WAF is also a paid service. Um, and uh, when it comes to, you know, paying for these services, uh, or also, you know, there are some, you know, third party as well, like, you know, Cisco, you know, provides the capability inside the AWS. Um, Apollo Alto security tools, you know, they they have, you know, their own, uh, you know, AWS offering or F5. Uh, so these are, you know, some common uh, security vendors um, that mainly provide the services for, for the on-prem, but, you know, they have the footprint or capabilities or offerings in the cloud as well. And what they do is, um, instead of, you know, purchasing, let's say, a Cisco chassis, let's say, which is uh, $100,000 in cost. Uh, in the cloud, you probably will get it, let's say, you know, uh, maybe uh, $10 an hour or $2 an hour, or maybe at times um, in pennies, you pay in pennies per hour, you know, for, you know, uh, the similar capability for which, you know, the, you make, um, you know, uh, the CapEx um, uh, investment, you know, if you're doing it in the, uh, for your on-prem. So majority, uh, to answer your question again, um, majority of these services, uh, they are uh, come as part of your uh, infrastructure uh, or your, you know, uh, cloud account. Uh, you do not have to pay much, but I know there are, you know, some sof sophisticated ones. If you want to, you know, utilize that capabilities, then, you know, you, you pay uh, by an hour or by a minute uh, for, you know, for the usage of them. Right. So sorry, my husband is a network engineer, so I've heard half of these names that you just mentioned. So that's why I know because creating a firewall is not an easy task. So I was just wondering, like, you know, with uh, that instance, say, being terminated, so the firewall also goes away. So I guess you just answered my question. I was just thinking that every each aspect of these were were to be bought yeah. separately or paid separately. And you, know, you already answered that. Thank you. Sure. And, um, you know, uh, along the same lines uh, so what happens is previously you know used to take days at times weeks to configure let's say a big um, big chassis uh, uh, or or firewall at a distribution layer but now um, you can do it in minutes um, if you have interest in it you know you can uh, just simply go and you know get that attached and um, you know, uh, pay <clears throat> pay by an hour or by a minute, and you know, get that configured, you know, right away for you. Okay, so this was the infrastructure protection uh, for the data data protection or the or your data inside the infrastructure. Um, Amazon, you know, offering similar type of services, different names. Uh, Macy is one which is uh, uh, AWS Macy. What it does is Let's say if you have you know PII data residing in there, it will PII stands for personal identifiable information, that information that actually um, identifies me. Let's say my name, my my date of birth, my social security, um, my address, my phone number. You know these are the information which uh, uh, I want them to be you know secure. So let's say you know you have you are a company that is you know collecting all this information. Um, let's say in different forms and you have, you know, the data residing there. So what this uh, Macy service does is it actually detects, um, let's say if there are, you know, social security numbers, you know, in that data or uh, and uh, or let's say, you know, if my my date of birth, you know, uh, is, you know, uh, is is one of the fields, you know, which is, uh, you know, inside the uh, let's say inside that file. And if this file is not encrypted, if it is sitting as a text file or if it is in, sitting as unencrypted database, then Macy will detect and Macy will inform uh, through the dashboard that you know we have a data at risk because uh, it is sitting there unencrypted. So what Macy does is you know it goes in and you know um, the level of X, you know the uh, the level of uh, I would say, uh, let's say, you know, you have uh, different services running in here. So let's say you, you granted access to the entire uh, infrastructure. 
then you know Macy is going to go in and you know validate um, uh, all of your services and then you know provide you information you know into a dashboard. But let's say uh, you don't want it to go. Let's say uh, you want it to go up to a certain layer. Uh, you can you know uh, narrow it down to you know those are specific areas only and uh, Macy will just you know keep monitoring those. Um, next one is AWS KMS or key management or key storage services. Key, uh, key is uh, this is the, your encryption keys. Let's say you encrypt your data, you encrypt your uh, S3 storage or you encrypt your databases or you encrypt your um, your OS volumes um, inside your uh, let's say inside your um, EC2 instances. So those encrypted ones they they have to have a key so instead of you managing and handling those keys by yourself let's say you know to your laptop or to some other server amazon actually you know offers this this is a kind of a vault service so it's a key vault whatever the key you have you know so so vault has the key um if you need access to it you go into the vault get the key decrypt the data read it and then you know put it back in so um that's that's one service and then you know there's another one which is hsm which is the similar thing but it's a hardware managed key um i don't know if most of you might have seen uh you know those rsa tokens right? those physical tokens uh they have you know those uh, six or eight digit numbers you know they get refreshed every minute so those are the hardware keys so amazon actually offers you know that the hardware key management as well for you which is called hsm Certificate manager actually it manages your HTTPS certificates, you know your your or SSL certificates. Uh, so it manages it. Uh, it has handles it for you. Um, let's say you are running some HTTPS, you know um, services or web services. So instead of you know managing it to some other location, um, it's a there's a secure location which you know Amazon offers that services for you. Secrets manager it manages your uh, your your database credential credentials or or other secrets um, secrets are you know um, the uh, the passwords or the uh, or, or the security you know um, credentials you know that um, secrets manager you know can handle that for you also and not just only you know holds it for you but you can you know rotate that as well there is a service called um, the common service uh, Slipping my mind. Um, we call it PAM or password authentic uh, password uh, access manager. So it's kind of a keyword that actually you know holds uh, QRadar. Uh, it's an IBM product, um, and um, you know, um, so that's you know a third party. So instead of you know using that third party, you can utilize you know Amazon's you know secrets manager services. Because it is, you know, part of your your ecosystem. You know, you do not have to go for uh, go for the third party. You know, pay them separately, um, and uh, you know, have them, you know, sit um, like you know, uh, you set aside as you know, a secure spot for it um, for the third party. Instead of that, what you do is, you know, you have your uh, secrets manager which is sitting there, and you can, you know, utilize that uh, by. Uh, you know, having that incorporated, you know, within your uh, your ecosystem. Um, the next one is the incident response. So inside the incident response, you know, although there are more, but you know, these are the two uh, major ones. One is the Amazon Detective. Uh, it investigate any potential security issues. Let's say if I find any security issue within my uh, my infrastructure, uh, it you know it uh, this uh, detective actually you know, helps me out for that. Um, then you know uh, Cloud Endor, which is the disaster recovery service. Um, so disaster recovery is, let's say you have your infrastructure in here, and you have your application and different components running in here. Let's say what if your entire infrastructure goes down, then you will not be able your you will not be able to serve your customers. Take an example. Let's say Amazon.com. You let's say you are managing Amazon.com, and one fine morning you find out that you know that site is not working, and you know you go in and investigate, find out that you know the entire infrastructure is down. 
if you do not have a disaster recovery or a DR site configured and built you know for you then your customers they will you know you will not get you know you will be losing that business right your customers will not you know get connect to you and you know they will not be able to make any purchases so the purpose of disaster recovery is let's say you have your infrastructure running and you know in parallel um and there are different you know areas in that you can have a uh, active active side or active passive side or or a hot side or a cold side or warm side so you have let's say you know uh, either a one on one replica or however many uh, infrastructure components you have in here you have you know the similar ones uh, you know and the other side as well so and you know this is serving your customers over the internet let's say if this site goes you know burned down to ground this site the your dr site will take over and it will get connected and it will start serving your customers so your customers will not see or, or feel or find any difference or uh, uh, like you know you will be serving your customers as as normal so how it does is um, so you have your you know main side let's say it was working so in parallel so you have your replication going uh, to your uh, to your DR site uh, the replication could be after certain intervals or it could be a real time let's say a comment uh, happened to database here um, in parallel uh, the commit happens to the uh, you know the database in the DR side as well that is like you know active active configuration but anyways the the purpose of you know uh, telling you all this that you know Amazon offers you know disaster recovery which is automated fast and cost effective method of uh, setting up a DR site for you for your business and then um, AWS compliance you know there are different compliances out there um, uh, government has their own compliances and then there are some industry compliances let's say uh, you are a credit card company or you you process credit cards then you uh, you fall under the PCI compliance PCI DSS compliance uh, let's say you deal with some government then you know there are some federal related compliance you know inside the US uh, US and you know for other countries you know they have uh, similar compliances as well Europe has a very um, very popular compliance or regulate regulatory compliance thing which is called GDPR um, that's very uh, very strict and stringent uh, that is for the privacy of their uh, of their uh, you know citizens um, let's say you know you are dealing with healthcare systems so there is a HIPAA compliance um, and you know there are several other so Amazon actually uh, Amazon artifact service what it does is uh, it's a no cost self service portal for different compliances uh, it tells you let's say you define that you know I am dealing with uh, credit card so it will give you a dashboard information about your PCI compliance that you know what is your current compliance score where do you lag or what are the um the warning signs in here so that that you need to fix and what are the um you know the red signals you know that need to be addressed right away so this you know artifact service it actually you know of uh, provides you you know that level of details there's a term called rbac and it is it is an important term um if we have not heard yet you will hear it pretty soon whenever you go whenever you start working uh, not just only in the cloud but whenever you start working in the in the user management side so uh, our bag stands for role based access control let's say um as an example let's say i'm an engineer in a, in a in a company and let's say next to me is a finance manager so we both have two different roles and based on our roles you know, uh, we um, the the IT team defines it. You know, inside the system that you know this IT guy will have access to you know these specific areas. Uh, this finance guy will have uh, access to you know these specific areas. I cannot step into uh, the let's say the financial reporting or let's say if it's a public company, you know, I cannot uh, look into the 10K that is being reported or what is the current uh, what is their uh, uh, or, or let's say you know if it's uh, you know the person you know the finance guy 
is responsible for, let's say, for the pricing uh, of you know certain specific products. So me being an IT guy, although I will have access to the system, but I will not have access to you know uh, the data underneath it. So you know these uh, granular details they are normally defined uh, as part of the RBAC or the role based access control. I'm not going to drain this entire slide. Um, I'll let you guys, you know, uh, look into that. And if you have any question, you know, um, feel free to you know, reach out to me. Uh, you know, as I said, so um, the main purpose of it, of this RBAC is to provide a granular control to those specific areas only uh, where the access is required. Otherwise, you know, do not grant any access. Okay. All right, um, and this is the same thing, you know, um, just some, you know, additional depiction, you know, let's say, you know, this HR person, HR person has access to the general roles and the HR roles, uh, and this, you know, IT security person has access to the IT and uh, the general roles, but IT does not have access to the finance or or the sales or you know um, these type of things. So you 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 define you know these roles in here and then each role uh, will have its own you know specific purposes. Say oh sorry. If I go in here, oh, sorry here. Come on. Okay. So finance, you know, they have access to the customer database, but IT they have access to the data center. So these roles have a specific purpose on that specific area. So let's say in the finance, uh, you see you have only you're seeing only one person. Let's say you know the finance uh, get more people inside the finance, they will be granted access or they will be rolled into this specific finance role. Once the role is uh, once they are onboarded into that role. This role already on, so this is on the left hand side. On the right hand side, the role it's already is already associated with the customer database. The finance team can you know go uh, to the um, to the customer side. Uh, what is uh, the another use case? Another use case of uh, this thing is, let's say you are, um, let's say if I do not have a finance role and um, I have you know one person who is managing my customer data. He is the finance guy. Let's say um, down the road the team increased, let's say 100 folds, and now we have uh, say you know 100 resources here, right? So assigning each single person to this customer database, this will be a tedious task. Or let's say you know. Um, there's something happened and you know they shut down let's say 50 percent of the resources now that you know the person will have to roll off each of them individually so in order to avoid this um or in order to make this you know roll on roll off process more easier and also you know the granular control uh, inside that uh, for that what what we do is we create the role and assign you know those additional users you know to that role so if that person is is getting rolled off, we'll just you know remove them from you know from that specific role, and that person is rolled off. This this is a very very basic example. You know, at times what happens is um, finance. You know, there let's say there are let's say twenty different roles, and then you know one person is assigned to that role, two person assigned to this one, and you know let's say all of all of them they are assigned to that specific role. So that's where you know this R back you know comes into play and helps out. Then instead of you know a person uh, manually going in and checking in, okay, you know person A has access to let's say are out of those you know 15 roles, a person A has access to let's say you know three of them or five of them or maybe all 15 of them, <clears throat> and person B has you know different level. So this RBAC will tell us, hey, you know what, uh, this is what our current landscape is. Plus it helps you out in uh, when you go to the uh, going to the audits. That you know, audit team ask you, hey, um, like what level of access you have given, and who are those people, and you know what roles are given to them. <clears throat> Excuse me. 
So this thing, you know, the, this RBEC actually uh, helps out, you know, in the area as well. All right, moving on next, um, the DDoS attack. So DOS attack, uh, let's just look into the DOS attack first. DOS means denial of service. Let's say I have a web server. Hmm. Hmm. For some reason, I am not able to doodle into it. But anyways, um, so inside that, uh, let's say I am uh, running a web server. Let's say I am running Amazon.com. And that is, you know, connected to the internet that is serving uh, my customers. Um, all of a sudden, what happened is uh, find out that, you know, this server is shown that it is down. But the server is uh, that, you know, my customers start complaining, hey, you know what? We are not able to access this Amazon.com services. We go in and find out that, you know, hey, this server is running. It has a web server running. Everything is looking fine. What's happening? So what happened is this um, I'm just giving I'm going to give you one example. Let's say it's just only one server, basic server, uh, nothing fancy in it. Um, over the Internet, what it does is um, uh, how, how this DOS attack works is let's say somebody uh, started sending malicious packets very aggressively and they all are destined toward your the server so like this uh malicious hacker it flooded this server and this server received so many requests um that every actually web server they have you know certain specific threshold that they can accept up to this level let's say this has for example you know it can accept let's say thousand requests a minute and uh, when this you know flooding started all these you know requests coming in um, let's say it exceeded you know it, it exceeded 1000 so at one point in time the server will not have enough cycles to to accommodate you know all those requests and then you know the its performance start degrading up to a point that it will either crash or it will stop you know uh, addressing those requests. So once it crashed or it stopped requesting, that is called denial of service. Like it was offering a service, which is let's say a web service, which is Amazon.com. Now that you know it was flooded or pounded or flooded so hard that you know it stopped and it stopped uh, to a point that you know it just crashed itself. So that is the uh, the denial of service that you know. Um, that somebody you know flooded it so hard that you know uh, it, it came to a point that you know it crashed. So that is the denial of service um, from a, uh, let's say from 2000 feet or 20,000 feet overview. Now come to this you know distributed piece. Distributed piece how it does is instead of you know having one single computer flooding the internet or flooding this you know Amazon.com. Instead of that one, um, there are tons and tons of you know different servers, and they are across the globe. And uh, they are their purpose is to just target the uh, target this server here. Their purpose is let's say this is the victim server or this is the Amazon.com server, and their purpose is to just you know flood that you know all those let's say you know there are tens and thousands of of out there uh, you know they are scattered across the globe. So this is a distributed denial of attack. Like instead of just one machine attacking it, um, you have you know tons and tons of machines you know doing the similar thing. Um, from the back end, what happens is you know, there's a bot master or call it a hacker. So instead of you know this hacker uh, you know getting all these machines and you know getting it uh, getting them to uh, you know attack your um, your Amazon.com instead of that. Um, it created a command control server and you know that command control server you know controls the uh, other hacked machines. Let's say I went to a website, my machine got hacked, my antivirus was not updated, my machine got hacked. 
now I am at the mercy of that hacker. And uh, hacker, that hacker, instead of um, you know going into my machine and collecting or pulling my data from my machine or let's say from my laptop, uh, he actually you know put a botnet there, and that botnet what it does is it just you know floods the internet and you know sending the packets let's say to Amazon.com. So my my victimized machine is one of the instances, and then you know there are let's say you know tens or thousands you know out there, and they will you know they're doing the similar thing. So that's the um, the basic gist of you know uh, denial of service attacks. Uh, there are some you know uh, AWS learning and training uh, details. Uh, once you get the slide deck, you can go in there and you know check. Uh, and there's some you know free learning library as well if you want to go deep down into it. Uh, can I just ask one question? Sure. Uh, in the instance of botnet attacks that you just explained, uh, in case there is a backup uh, server or whatever was the term you were using earlier, or they have a DUI yes. recovery, whatever that was. Does that get affected as well, uh, or that that can take over? That that can take over. Uh, this is you know I just picked one server as an example. Okay. Uh, let's say you know I have only one server and that is you know being attacked. But let's say okay. you know you have you know servers you know different. Or uh, let's say you have a server farm, and so yeah, one server being attacked, the other will be uh, you know will be serving the customers. Okay. Thank yeah. you. Sure. Okay. All right. Um, next one is monitoring and management. Uh, how do we monitor our accounts? Aleidarbhai, you have a question? I see your hand raised. Yes, uh, I sent one message to you, but uh, as we have experience from Unix point of view, Unix is not allowing to hack anything inside as it is changing the memory locations when it is start or up. How is it possible that in Amazon we are having the issue of hacking? So uh, one thing is um, they say that you know there is no virus for uh, Linux or Unix. That's correct. But when it comes to uh, getting hacked, when it comes to uh, getting attacked, no operating system or no service is safe. Um, Either you have service running on Microsoft platform or Unix platform or Mac OS or um, Linux platform. Um, I say you you left it open. Uh, people will start, you know, uh, um, you know, they'll they'll start, you know, uh, perform all sorts of malicious activities, you know, into it. So you have to, you know, secure the uh, the operating system, no matter what type of OS you are running. Either it's running on on-prem or on the cloud, uh, similar principles. It has to be secure. Let's say if I build one uh, AWS or build one any Linux machine uh, at my office or you know in my home, and I just you know leave it open and you know get it connected to the internet with all the services running open, no security running on it, it will take uh, minutes uh, to you know to get it hacked. Okay. All right. Um, next one is the monitoring and management. Um, I'm going to quickly cover this, then we'll take um, five minutes break uh, before we start on. This. It's, this is a smaller, uh, a smaller piece here. So monitoring and management. Um, Amazon provides different monitoring capabilities. Uh, CloudWatch is one of them, and CloudTrail is another of them. The purpose of uh, let me just quickly go to the CloudWatch first. So purpose of CloudWatch is it has it gives you the complete visibility. If you remember when we created the the console, oh sorry, the uh, the instance, and then inside the instance, you know, at the bottom you were seeing some some graph. One was for the CPU, RAM, or network, and whatever and whatnot. That how is the uh, you know uh, the uh, the usage is looking like. So. Uh, so those are actually, you know, uh, those graphs that are being shown. They are uh, part of the CloudWatch. Um, it's a single pane of glass. Um, some of the services are free, and if you want to go for detailed uh, analysis or detailed services, then uh, it's uh, you have to pay for it. 
And uh, so what it does is CloudWatch, it actually gives you a visibility into your resources and application. Let's say, you know, how your CPU is doing, how your RAM is doing, how your storage is doing, and then it collects it. Uh, it gives you a single pane of glass for monitoring and that help you to act on and uh, you can automate that, you know, this act part. Let's say uh, you set up a, a rule that, you know, soon as my CPU hits 85%, for example, then create one more similar instance. Let's say if this is the EC2 instance, um, so it will create another EC2 instance of the similar size or similar capacity. Um, so this is like automated action uh, based on the monitoring. Let's say uh, the other rule you set up and soon as my CPU goes down to, let's say 50%, uh, terminate this instance. So it will automatically terminate this instance for you. And then based on that, you know, it will give you uh, the um, the analysis or you can analyze, you know, how how my my current um, you know infrastructure is doing. So this is um, you know one of the purposes of CloudWatch. On the contrary, CloudTrail, what it does is uh, it actually help you trail back, or you can you know find the trail of that of that specific event. Let's say, um, and you know that event could be um, let's say I try to log into my uh, to my production system 3 a.m. in the morning although my shift hours are, let's say, 8 to 5, uh, 8 to 5 p.m. What what was I doing at 3 a.m.? So, you know, um, you know, after after, you know, let's say management finds out that Faisal logged into the system at 3 a.m. and, you know, he was there in the system for, let's say, for a couple of minutes, then they're going to go and look into the logs and those logs, they are collected by CloudTrail and uh, CloudTrail, what it does is, um, you know, it collects the logs, um, it captures the logs for you, and then um, you can put those logs into um, into your S3 bucket or to some central repository, and then um, you can, you know, create an event out of those uh, those trail logs um, to find out that you know what was Fassel's purpose on that, or let's say you have uh, you know set a defined rule that you know whenever i see let's say 500 error inside my uh, inside my uh, uh, inside my logs um then you know uh, perform you know some action into the database and check the database that you know database is connecting fine if not then you know check the database services if they are working fine or if they are not then restart those you know services and then you know uh, check back again you know if uh, after that after restart of the services uh, if this you know 500 error again came up or not so you know the uh, that's the uh, you know another that's that's one use case of you know uh, using the cloud trail uh, cloud trail there are different use cases as well it could be used for compliance purposes uh, say you want to know um that who who access our PII database uh, in let's say in the last six months. And uh, so, you know, wh whoever accesses the database, you know, the, the, um, you know, that will be logged, you know, every action has a has a trail log, you know, and uh, this is what we're going to see in one of the labs. And um, so, you know, for the compliance purposes, you can go in and, you know, check for that governance purpose, you know, just one example I gave you that, you know, keep an eye out that, um, let's say you know why Fassel was there you know into the system um say um during the off, not during the business hour but you know off business hours you can do the security analysis or operational excellence or data data exfiltration let's say you know you have you know some uh, uh let's say you have like let's say 200 terabytes of uh, data sitting there and you want to you know collect some specific information out of it so you can use it for the uh, data exfiltration purposes as well all right um so you know uh, whatever the use cases we are seeing in here you know these are you know some of the um like some diagrams you know i i put it up for you guys um security analysis or compliance aids 
Um, same thing, you know, exfiltration as well. And the operational excellence. All right, so next one is the storage. Uh, and I think storage is the last one. I'm going to stop here. We're going to take five minutes break. I know that we are over an hour now sitting in here. I'll let you guys go um, stretch out. We'll come back in five minutes and then, you know, we'll, we'll start on this uh, storage services. Just set the timer here. We already have the five minutes timer. OK. I'm going to put you guys on mute and I will be back shortly.
or I'm back. Um, and I was going uh, a bit faster pace today. Um, do you guys have any questions um, so far? You guys able to understand um, the concept so far? Yes, so far is good following up what you are saying. All right, perfect. OK. All right, so let's get started. Um, last topic of today, um, a very interesting one which is uh, AWS Storage Services. Amazon offers, just like other cloud providers, you know, different uh, storage, a different type of storage services. Um, there are two distinct types. One is the block storage, and there is the uh, object storage. What is the main difference uh, between the two? Um, object storage is, Let's say you know you have storage uh, specific storage area. Let's say it's uh, two gig in size. Um, the content that you are going to put in, they are going to be put in as one single object at a time. Let's say you have some text files. Let's say you have some graphic files, your your video files, um, some spreadsheets, and all that. So you just you know put it in there uh, as an individual component. These each individual component, its own um, you know metadata, uh, its own you know information you know around that, uh, maybe its own security around that as well. So object storage, its main purpose is you know to consider it considers every component as a single object there. On the contrary, the block storage is. Let's say you have a similar size uh, two gig. So you will get an entire block of a storage and main purpose of this block storage is, you know, it is mainly it is attached to your operating system. Let's say you have your D drive or E drive on your um, on your, you know, uh, Windows laptops or let's say your uh, slash dev partition on your Linux machines or some other party or slash data partition on your Linux machines or Unix machines. So mainly the block storage is, you know, the entire block of storage is you know, assigned to it and how you put in the content into it. It could be some files or it could be um, some big chunk of data or a big chunk, you know, reserved, uh, let's say for for backups or whatever the purpose it may be. Uh, so the block is like, you know, big block of ice which is you know attached to your operating system and on the contrary the object is, object storage is uh, same big block but you know it has you know the smaller cubbies or smaller uh, you know spaces you know uh, in there where you are putting each individual component for you so this is the you know the main uh, demarcation you know uh, between the two uh, object and the block storages amazon has a block storage which is called S3. Uh, S3 stands for Simple Storage Services. So three S's, so that's why they call it S3. Um, and they come in buckets. So Amazon calls it buckets. Uh, Azure calls it blobs, blob storages. Um, on the contrary, for the block storages, um, Amazon has two different types. One is called the one is called the EFS or Elastic File System. It is the NFS type or Network File System type capability. Um, um, and the other was uh, the next one is called the EBS or Elastic Block Storage. Um, elastic block, block Storage is like you are attaching, let's say, a USB drive to your laptop. So the USB drive, let's say, if it's two gig in size, you know, you attach to it to the operating system. Now that operating system will have, you know, extended storage, you know, attached to it. EFS is like, you know, you have some net, uh, <clears throat> uh, some uh, storage system sitting somewhere uh, and then, you know, through the uh, through the network, uh, you brought in that, you know, let's say 
that five gig of you know block and then attach it to your operating system so it, it's coming you know uh for, you know through the uh, through the network and uh or the nfs capability um as an example nfs stands for network file system um those of you you know uh, who work in a corporate environment you know on your let's say windows servers you know you have let's say you know hr drive or finance drive or data drive which is you know coming from the network and you know being attached to your uh, to your laptop or maybe to your server and uh, you have your data in there that you access so that's the you know uh, this efs is the same capability and ebs is like you know you attaching a a, a usb drive to it okay um, Next one is uh, we're going to go a little bit deep dive uh, into the blocks. Oh, sorry, object storages, S3 buckets. Um, S3 bucket or S3 actually offers uh, different uh, types of, you know, um, uh, the storage services. One is called the standard S3. Uh, that is, you know, the use cases mainly is for the you know, websites or the uh, like you can put your website data or mobile or gaming app or or some cloud applications or some big data analytics like you are putting in uh, you know a lot of data you know in there so s3 standard s3 pricing wise as similar as um easy to on demand instance let's put it this way uh it's readily available and uh you just you know create the bucket and uh, you can you know start using it for AWS free tier account, Amazon offers five gig of space on S3 bucket. Uh, one thing on the S3 bucket side is the bucket name has to be unique. So let's say I pick Fessel Abbas uh, as an S3 bucket name, uh, then no one else in the world will be able to pick that name until I delete that bucket and then someone else will pick it up. Um, the other tiering services of S3 are um, one is called the S3 intelligent tiering. This is the it has you know machine learning algorithm running behind it, and it is uh, used for cost optimization. So it automatically moves your infrequent data or infrequently used data to the uh, lower redundancy or to the um, to the other cost effective tiers. Uh, so there is a uh, machine learning algorithm, you know, running underneath it. Um, then the third type is called the S3 reduced redundancy. Um, is this uh, similar S3, but instead of, you know, having it replicating the data to other regions, it just replicate just within one region. Okay. So it has, you know, re reduced redundancy. So let's say, you know, if that region goes down, your that bucket will go down as well. Uh, but this actually, you know, gives you a lot of cost saving, you know, capabilities. Uh, S3 infrequent access. Uh, it is mainly used for the long term storages. Let's say, you know, backup solution or the DR solution or files that you do not frequently access. Let's say you have your um, quarterly financial uh, analysis that is accessed every quarter or let's say your uh, tax certain documents that is accessed let's say after every year or after every 11 months so then you know uh, instead of you know putting it into the standard uh paying the premium prices uh you you know put it into the infrequent access or uh, uh you know s3 ia uh tiering then s3 one zone is um is a similar thing that you know it gives you only for that one specific zone uh it will not be replicated to the other zones and uh, you know this is also you know the cost saving measure um another one is um, um they call it a uh, glacier service or the archival service uh, it is a long-term infrequent access let's say uh, for some organizations uh, the audit requirement is that data um, they cannot purge the data for seven years. So you you will have to keep the data for seven years and you will not going you you are not going to access that. Uh, that is let's say that is for sure. So you're gonna just put it into the glacier, uh, sorry, glacier storage services that uh it is uh it is mainly for the 
uh, long term in frequent access. So it will be just you know sitting there and it will be accessed when the need arises. Otherwise, you know it will just uh, stay there. And uh, um, from the pricing standpoint, this is uh, the cheapest one. Um, you know the Glacier services. Inside the Glacier, Amazon actually uh, came up previously. Amazon used to have only one Glacier service. Then they came up with another uh, Glacier Deep Archive, which is like a further additional tiering um, cost wise that you know you're going to be paying lesser compared to Glacier, but you know you're going to have that data sitting there that you know you know that you will not access that that frequently. OK. On the other hand, in the block storages, um, EFS, as I mentioned, you know, it's an NFS type of capability that, you know, uh, there's a storage piece which is coming over the network and connecting to your uh, either Windows or Linux instances. Um, the other one is the EBS or Elastic Block Storage. Um, there are two different types. One is the SSD and another one is the HDD. SSD is uh, uh, SSD back storage, it is faster storage. Uh, it is mainly used for transactional workloads like databases that you know they frequently go in and write frequent writes or the boot volumes. Boot volumes are uh, say your C drive on your laptop. Uh, when you restart, when you start your laptop, um, the boot volume kicks in and you know boot volume has you know the uh, boot operating system uh, that actually you know makes your uh, up, uh, you know, operating system, you know, go up and, you know, um, the the faster the boot volume is, the faster your laptop or your system will, uh, you know, power up. And then, you know, also another use case is the data volumes. HDD is, you know, it's it's mainly throughput intensive, not um, the transaction workloads. Uh, they are not that fast and uh, they are based on the older principle of hard drives that have the, you know, uh, the heads and the platter that, you know, the the their platters and then, you know, the head actually, you know, goes and reads uh, reads it. So it's um, it's not that very fast compared to SSD. SSD stands for solid state drive. Like there is no mechanical component uh, inside the SSD. It's all electronics. Um, I do not have that this time, but um, yeah, in our next class, I'll, I'll show you um, the the SSD storage. Uh, it's like, you know, a regular circuitry that you cannot tell a difference, uh, but that is, you know, that has a key. That's why, you know, it is way faster than the hard drive uh, or HDD, you know, backed storage. So they are slower in speed. So they are mainly used for your know, log processing or some business continuity work or, you know, or any type of work that does not require uh, that faster throughput or faster access. All right, um, I'm going to just hold off to this availability. Let me just drag it down there. Drag down this one as well. OK. Um, oh, OK. All right, so AWS S3, um, S3 standard tier durability is 11 nines. Actually, Design durability for all the S3 services is 11 nines, and I'll, I'll come to it uh, in a bit. What is this? You know, 11 nine means. Uh, you gotta remember this for the exam standpoint, and also for uh, interview standpoint as well. It's a, it's a very common interview question. Um, 11 nine means 99 point, and then nine times nines. This is a guaranteed durability by Amazon. Therefore, any of the S3 service, uh, the durability will be 11 nines. But the availability is different. Uh, majority of them, um, uh, not, not majority. Yeah, I would say majority of them is uh, four nines. It's 99.9. .9. But you know, there are some which are three nines like 99.9, 99.9. .9, and one is 99.5, okay? And we will come to it. Uh, what, are, what are these, you know, percentages, you know, stand for? Availability SLA, Amazon guarantees, although it is designed for four nines, 
but Amazon guarantee you the SLA or the service level agreement when Amazon signs the agreement with you that instead of four nines, they commit for three nines for the S3 standard tier. And then, you know, for the other ones, you know, these are the numbers here. S3 availability zone for the standard tiering is more than or equal to three. Whatever the data in the standard tiering I'm going to put in, it will be replicated to at least minimum of three on and at times, you know, more than three different regions or di sorry, different zones. OK, so my data, I know that, you know, if let's say. Um, I'm running in. Um, I'm running an S3 bucket in, uh, uh, let's say, Virginia region. Virginia region, if you remember, it has six AZ or six availability zone. So that my data will be replicated across those AZs or across those data centers. Um, same goes with intelligent hearing, more than three, more than three. One zone IA that has one, and it's, uh, it's a very trick question. Uh, comes in exam and also, you know, uh, interview as well that, you know, you have S3 one zone IA or infrequent access. How many AZs will it be replicated to? Uh, as the name says, one zone, right? So it will be replicated to only one zone. Like it will not be replicated. It will be just staying in that one zone only. Okay. For a glacier and deep archive, same thing, you know, three or more than three. Um, I'm not going to drain the rest of the slide. It's, you know, uh, it's pretty obvious. I'll let you guys, you know, read that and, uh, you know, get back to me for any questions like, you know, first byte latency, what is that? Uh, it's all, you know, milliseconds except for the glacier. So first byte latency is um, when will the first chunk of the data I am going to get, like how long is going to take when I access when I try to access that the the first chunk of the data for all these tiering it's in milliseconds but in glacier it takes a couple of minutes and for the uh for the deep archive it takes hours okay so if my data is sitting in the glacier service which is the archival service the first byte or the first, um, you know, first chunk of the data, I will not be able to access that. Uh, it will take some time because Amazon, you know, goes in and then, you know, fetches the data for you. It takes some time, and that time is, you know, at times minutes or sometimes it, you know, it takes hours for me to, you know, uh, recover that data. Okay. Um, same thing, you know, um, same principle. And then, you know, uh, this is mainly, you know, the, the use cases for, you know, these tierings. Uh, standard frequently access or glacier archival of the data and all that, right? Um, same, uh, you know, minim, uh, we just saw the uh, is this minimum storage duration. Standard, there is no minimum duration. I can keep it for one second or I can keep it for one year, okay? Um, but for the other ones like intelligent hearing, uh, this intelligent here kicks in after 30 days, you know, like minimum duration is 30 days. Uh, pretty much, uh, you know, the other ones 30 days as well. Glacier has 90 days and the deep archive has 180 days. Minimum billable object, uh, there is no minimum there. Whatever the size is sitting there, uh, it will start charging for it. Uh, for the rest is 128 KB or kilobyte. And for the glacier is 40 KB. Um, retrieval fee um, for the IA through glacier deep archive is per GB fee apply. Let's say I have you know data sitting in the deep archive. I'm trying to access after let's say one year. Uh, let's say my data size is let's say 20 gig. So I will be charged per gig, you know, whatever the fee is. Okay. All right, same goes with the EBS um, that, you know, EBS, as we saw, you know, there's SSD base and there's a HDD or hard drive base. So 
Under the SSD, there is um, EBS IOPS and journal purpose. And under the HDD is the throughput optimized and the cold hard drive. And you know they have you know different uh, values there, like volume sizes. What is the minimum and max? You know it is mentioned there, and also the maximum throughput um, SSD base um, I/O optimized thousand megabytes per second is the speed. Okay, and the general purpose SSD is two two hundred fifty megabytes per second. And then you know there's a pricing structure per GB is um. 0.125, um, like 12, 12 cents per gig per month. That's the pricing. And then for for this one is uh, what 0 0.2, 0 0.02, uh, five uh, cents per uh, per gigabit per minute. That's the that's the pricing for the cold one. Um, exam, uh, they don't ask question around the pricing um, unless you know they they make changes uh, but normally like I have seen in the past you know they do not uh, you know charge you for or they, they, they do not ask you question on the on the pricing because you know the pricing model um, they change very frequently okay um, this is the same thing you know we, which we just discussed and then you know there are some use cases uh, could be used for operating system, database, application, uh, enterprise application, or you know business continuity. If I want to look into this, um, there's the EBS versus S3. Okay, one is the block storage, one is the object storage. Um, Performance-wise, EBS is very fast. Amazon, you know, S3 is faster. Typical use case. This is important one. EBS is a disk drive, or or it is an OS drive, or uh, not the OS drive. It is the uh, storage that is attached to your operating system, so it's a disk. But S3 is an online storage. Like you know, you have you may have you know the um, Microsoft OneDrive or or Shutterfly or um, um, you know there are different you know. Um, are different use cases for that, you know. Uh, so these are some of them, you know, which uh, I just, you know, um, it, they just popped up to my mind. So S3, mainly for online storage, EBS or EFS, it's a disk drive, okay? Um, three principles, availability, reliability, and um, Durability. Reliability is the ability to work properly. The, how reliable it is. How much can I rely on it? Even if it has, you know, some components failed, uh, will it still be able to serve me? So that's the reliability factor. Durability factor is um, its ab ability, like how durable it is, like how uh, how much, um, like its ability not to lose the data. How long can it with, withstand the data? If all, all the odds are against it, uh, how long can it uh, you know, hold my data? That's the durability factor. Availability is the ability to uh, ability of less downtime. Like how for how long will it be running for me, the application or that service, uh, without giving me a downtime? Because for businesses, the biggest nightmare is their downtime. They don't want it. Uh, like no business wants uh, a downtime or an outage to their system. Let's say if there's an outage uh, on on their system, uh, what is the guaranteed service level agreement with Amazon that for how many minutes or for how many hours per month or per year, Amazon guaranteeing it that they will have their have our system uh, be available for us. So that's that falls under the availability. OK. OK, availability SLA. This is an interesting one. OK, uh, before I go into it, um, 
Do you guys have any question on this? Availability, reliability, and durability. I just, I just have one. Yeah, sure. Uh, in uh, case there's a downtime, do Amazon has a limit of, uh, you know, callings? Like, is there a place they, uh, business can, IT people can call? Or how to, how, how to figure out that this is because of who? So there are a couple of ways, you know, let's say you have a business account. They provide you a support number, support contact. You call the support and find out. You open a ticket with them and um, they'll, they'll get back to you, provide you the support there. Or, or at times, you know, let's say if it's a bigger outage, Amazon then publishes it to their website. The, let's say, you know, their S3 service is down or let's say their North Virginia region is down or let's say their uh, Ohio region has, uh, you know, one availability zone is entirely down. The rest of the two are working fine. So these are the things, you know, if there's a bigger outages, Amazon publishes it. Otherwise, you know, you are seeing, you know, some disruption in the service. Uh, they provide you contact details. Uh, you can contact their support. Uh, you can create a ticket. But let's say you have the enterprise uh, uh, agreement with them. Uh, with the enterprise agreement, you know, they provide you a TAM. TAM stands for Technical Account Manager. Um, so what is the purpose of TAM is? TAM is like a dedicated customer service person for your business. TAM is your first point of contact. Let's say you, you're having some interruption in the services, then, um, then let's say your, your IT department contact the TAM, find out, hey TAM, what is happening? And then TAM, you know, goes in and checks and then get back to, hey, you know what? Uh, let's say, you know, this service is, you know, currently down or the service is currently uh, facing some disruptions here. And um, I'm going to come to it uh, in our next slide uh, about the availability. What is the uh, the the agreement and based on that agreement? Um, let me just come to it. All right, so based on these agreements. Um, this is not Amazon's availability SLA. This is a general uh, availability SLA uh, table. And uh, I have not seen any system or any company that is guaranteeing 100%, okay? If anybody says that, you know, we are 100% uh, available, that's a lie on your face. I have not seen any system. Even you have everything running in parallel or you know um, all sorts of you know high availability that you have configured you will not be able to get uh, you know 100 percent the closest one you will get is the 911s okay we're going to come to it in a second so what does 90 percent availability means 90 percent means one nine okay what does it mean is with one nine Downtime per year will be 36 days. Downtime per day will be 2.4 hours. Let's say you build a system um, and uh, you got the 90% of one nine um, availability SLA with your vendor. With 90% availability SLA mean that your system can go down up to two and a half almost uh, two and a quarter hour, two and a three quarter hour per day. If your system can, can with, withstand that level of downtime or outage, you know, go for it. Um, most of the time, what I have seen in the working in the industry, it is mostly, you know, five nines or four nines. These are the ones which are very common. common agreed SLAs among the, you know, between the vendor and the um, and the firm or, 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 or the organization. So what does it mean? Uh, four nine means it is 99.99, .99, like four times nines. Downtime per year is 52 minutes, almost a little under an hour. Like in a year, in a calendar year, your system may go down for at least, at least an hour or minimum an hour. 
If I convert that into per month is 4.38 or under a mi under five minutes per month or a minute per week. OK, if I. The more I go down this list, the number of fives are increasing. The number of downtime is decreasing as well, like the the number uh, the amount of downtime is decreasing. OK, so five nines, what does it mean? that per year in a year's calendar year cycle, my system will. Uh, may go down. Uh, 5.26 minutes, OK? Or if it's a day, uh, if I split that into, you know, uh, into a, a downtime per day, uh, it will be 864 milliseconds. That will be a glitch. You will not even notice and, you know, your system glitch and then, you know, get back again for you. Nine nines. And this is the availability, OK, not the durability. Nine nines availability means that I can have my system can withstand a downtime of. 31.5 milliseconds or it uh, in a year or 86 microseconds. In a day, it's like a blink of an eye. And you know, system is back online. What's happening is here in this case. Um, I have not seen on the on-prem side. These are the oh, sorry on the on-prem side. These are the common ones four nines and five nines, but there are organizations, you know, let's say they are running a production workload, but they are not running a very critical one. Um, if you can withstand or if your business can withstand um, a longer period of downtime, uh, the the smaller the number here, the bigger the downtime. OK, uh, so this is like an inversely proportional uh, you know, equation here. If I go back to our. Uh, S3 SLA. If you remember it here. Uh, uh, how do I clean this? There's an eraser here. All right, so let me just erase it real quick here. Um, all right, so here in this case, if you see that, uh, I'm gonna just come on, come on. All right, so what do you see here? Um, okay, here in this case, look at this availability SLA. OK. For S3. Although it is designed for 99.99, like four nines, OK, but Amazon is guaranteeing only three nines. OK, if I go back in here. What does that three nines mean? OK, if I go in there, three nines mean three nine is this, which means that I can have a downtime of. 8.7. Per year or. Little under two minutes a day. For the. S3 standard, OK, now with the help of CloudWatch, CloudTrail. And other different tools. We can calculate, let's say. Uh, let's say I have, uh, let's say we have, you know, this uh, S3 intelligent hearing, which is 99, right? Two nines, okay? So with the two nines, let's say I have this one here. And uh, I find out, like, uh, you know, through those monitoring and management tools, I find out that our downtime, Amazon was guaranteeing 3.65 days, but it actually went a little over that. Let's say it went from 3.65 days to, let's say, four days okay based on that i can um you know go talk to amazon that this is what my monitoring system is telling me this is what you guaranteed me it is uh it is you know then um this is bigger than what you guarantee me so what is the next case and i and i have seen with you know several customers that when you go and dispute that with Amazon, Amazon refunds you. 
they give you you know uh, refund that you know that they guaranteed this much, but it exceeded the number. So this is the refund you're gonna get, and uh, even you do not have to dispute that. You can just you know file a request to them. Hey, you know what? This is what my system is telling me, and this is what you guaranteed. Numbers are not matching, and then you know no question asked. Most of the time, I've seen no question asked, and Amazon you know uh, gives you back the you know um, uh, gives you the charge back. Either they uh, gives you the money back, or they can prorate that money into your you know next year's bill or something like that. OK, um, I'm going to stop here. Uh, OK, before I stop, this is one thing I want you guys to. Read through it's not exam standpoint. Um, this is apart from AWS, uh, but uh, this may be a good learning for you guys. Like uh, you know, it's up. It talks about the dimensions of quality. Uh, let's say if somebody says that you know I have built a quality system. So these are the eight dimensions of that. Um, so you know, here's the link here as well, and you can you know go uh, do more research on it. It's a good talking point for, uh, if you're currently you know working, or if you are you know actively interviewing. I would suggest you know. Uh, to uh, you know, read through these you know eight points here that will help out having a conversation with the hiring manager. Or if you are currently working, you know, talk to your boss or talk to your team. Hey, you know what? I learned this new thing. Uh, these are the dimensions of quality. So if somebody says that, hey, you know what? This is uh, this is a quality product. Let's say. Let's say I claim that this is a quality product. Now. For you, uh, you're gonna start judging on it. Hey, how's the performance looks like? How are the features? How's the aesthetic looks like? How's the uh, durability looks like, or conformance, or you know, serviceability and all that. So uh, these are you know uh, eight points. You might wanna you know whenever you have the spare time, you know, look into that. This will help you out. Okay, um, we are um, almost top of the hour. Seven minutes left. I'm going to open the floor for you guys. Uh, I know we covered a lot of ground today. Uh, ground today. Um, open for any question or anything you want me to read for it for you guys. I hope that you guys are able to hear me. I am not on mute. Faisal, uh, yes. you mentioned uh, archival uh, stuff. Uh, what, what, what's the difference between uh, Glacier and the other term that you used? I forgot about it. Glacier. Deep archive. Yeah. Glacier deep archive, yes. So what's here it is. These two. Yep. So the difference is this. Uh, mainly, um, so you see the, gla oh, sorry. See the Glacier and deep archive Glacier. Minimum storage duration is 90 days and it has 180 days. Oh, OK, OK. So let's say you let's say you have your. Um, quarterly audit data coming in. And you actually access that after after a quarter. I would put it in the glacier. Let's say I have. Uh, but for the uh for the ordered reasoning i have to keep that data for let's say um seven years then i'm not gonna leave it under the glacier so i'm gonna just move it you know from glacier to deep archive also it will just sit there uh because the you know the processing structure is more cheaper compared to uh you know compared to the actual glacier Thank you. Sure. OK. Any other question? OK, I'm going to clean this uh, the slide deck and uh, you know all these doodling work that, that I've done and just clean it up and then I'll just upload it to the uh, to the OneDrive. I'll email it to you guys um, and uh, once the video gets processed, 
will upload to the uh, YouTube channel as well. Um, again, reminder, our next week's Thursday class um, has been pushed back, so there will not be any class on Thursday, which is the 11th March. That class uh, we are going to conduct on Saturday the 13th. Um, the same time class time will be the same is the day which is being pushed back. OK, so instead of Thursday, we will have the class on 13th. Yes, sister. I was just curious, like. Uh, we are everything in I thought like in Amazon was cloud based, so this concept of having block storage, which is similar to having a disk storage. Yeah. Why is this redundant kind of storage needed even? Yeah, so what happened is, you know, when you when you build a Linux OS, remember we we built two instances, one Windows and one Linux. Windows instance, the base size was 30 gig and the Linux instance was 8 gig. That is the OS volume out of which I would say 60 percent, 60 to 80 percent is being taken by the OS. The remainder 20 percent, um, let's say if you're building an application onto it or if you're storing some data onto it, that may not be enough. So that's why you need some additional storage to attach to it and you know uh, get the uh, get the uh, data stored there. Again, we are getting this storage still from Amazon services, right? So yes, yes. Are they, do, does it mean like if I can imagine it, does it mean at the back end Amazon has a disk drive for us? Yes, <laughs> oh, yes. Really? OK. Yeah, even even the OS storage, that's the disk drive Amazon has for you. Like for Windows, um, you know, the C drive that, you know, there is a storage. So Amazon has racks and racks of storage appliances, racks and racks of, you know, um, the other, uh, the compute appliances and the storage coming from those storage appliances and you'll get connected to it. You know, like you carve out, let's say 8 gig or you carve out 8 terabyte, whatever the size you carve out, it carves out for you and then, you know, gets attached to your, um, to your operating system. Right, so this is from an access point of view, right? So uh, what about like the time period for which this storage is available? Does that 180 days still apply to, to this? One? No, 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 oh, no. Okay, okay. So I, I think okay. I'm mixing it, right? So yeah. what would be the durability so of that this storage, storage? Yeah, that storage is EBS and EFS. That's not the S3 because S3 storage here, which we are seeing is a bucket. It's like, I don't know if you, do you have a Shutterfly account? Shutterfly, no. OK, do you have uh, any account where you like do you have iCloud account? Yes, I do. OK, so in your iCloud iCloud account, along with other things that you back up, you back up your four rows as well, right? So consider that iCloud like if it's a base account, I think I don't know what is the size what I, uh, Apple gives you and then, you know, after paying certain amount, you get that storage like, you know, let's say two terabyte of storage, right? Bigger storage. So that iCloud account storage, consider that as S3 bucket. OK, OK. OK, you, you use that iCloud as S3 bucket where you put in your files and you know your photos or movies or videos and whatever and whatnot, right? But you cannot use that iCloud to attach to your Windows drive and use it as a D drive or E drive, right? So that's that's the use case of s3 that s3 is for you know the uh, objects like your all the pictures on your phone that you are backing up on your on your icloud account each picture is one object that is being you know replicated or copied over to your icloud but here in the in the os side um from the operating system from the you know, linux or windows side we do not attach s3 we actually attach the ebs volumes this is the one EBS volume that is being attached. And uh, sorry, uh, one second. I, I I understand. So I mean, yeah, yeah. I mean, right now, even like even your emails, they have certain time period after which they are archived, deleted, right? Either deleted or archived. Yes, exactly. Right, yeah. right, right. Okay, got it. And but you know, but uh, some other storage like like Google Photos, I'm a big fan of them. Right now, I guess they are doing some changes. Their, those photos are there. Yes. Uh, for an unlimited time, I guess. OK, got it. Thank you so much. Yeah, sure. Sure. OK, any other question?
I hope all these things making sense to you guys. Um, since you guys are not asking questions, this is like one of the classes. Uh, like one of the. Quietest ones. Uh, which I taught so far. So. Let's hope I'm, I'm hoping that, you know, things are making sense to you. I'm not going too fast. And, uh, you know, you are understanding uh, what I'm trying to deliver to you guys here. I think somebody has their hand up. I'm not sure yes. they're asking a question. Gonna, yeah, sister, do you have any question? Uh, show that your hand is raised. I'm going to 